section twenty four of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmund dantes by edmund flagg chapter twenty two the last session of the chamber of deputies the usual hour for the opening of the chamber of deputies was three o'clock but the startling events of the last two days and especially of the last two hours demanded that it should be convened earlier at one o'clock the president of the chamber Soze took the chair on the left bank of the seine all the approaches were open save the bridges of the place de la concorde where strong detachments of cavalry were posted on guard within the chamber all was solemnity about three hundred members were present the opposition seemed joyous and confident though anxious the conservative party was troubled the ministerial benches were deserted at half-past one the president turned round in his chair and kept his eye fixed upon a side door as if expecting some one to enter suddenly a bustle was heard in that direction and the duchess of orleans in deep mourning attended by her two sons and followed by the dukes of montpensier and nemours entered the latter was received with marked expressions of dislike the count of paris garbed in complete black was conducted through the crowd to the space in front of the president's chair the duchess followed and seated herself in a fauteuil upon the same spot on each side of her was one of her sons and behind her stood her brothers the dukes of nemours and montpensier this position was subsequently changed for one more distant but otherwise remained throughout relatively the same being seated the duchess rose and bowed repeatedly to the assembly at the same moment an immense multitude of national guards and the people rushed in through the passages and despite the shouts of the officers you cannot enter the space beneath the tribune was instantly and densely thronged at the same time the public tribunes were invaded by a second body of the people for some minutes the greatest uproar prevailed at length it comparatively ceased and in a moment of quiet m dupin who had accompanied the duchess of orleans to the chamber ascended the tribune the stillness was instantly as great as had been the previous agitation the king has abdicated said m dupin the count of paris is nominated as his successor and the duchess of orleans as regent it is too late shouted a man from the gallery of the people the count of paris is proclaimed king by the chamber and the duchess of orleans regent exclaimed the president no 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 was the almost unanimous shout that now rose in the chamber i demand cried m lamartine that the royal family withdraw the question was put and the duchess and her sons after great hesitation were drawn away to a side door at the further end of the hall at the same moment a new crowd of the people rushed in and took seats beside the opposition members by whom they were welcomed i demand to speak cried m marie by the law of eighteen forty two the duke of nemours is regent how can the king abrogate that law i demand a provisional government a provisional government cried m cremieux we made a mistake in thirty let there be no mistake in forty-eight a provisional government said the abbe genoud a legitimist but it must be the will of the people m odillon barreau who had been long expected now entered and immediately mounted the tribune the crown of july rests on the head of a woman and a child cried the great lawyer the duchess of orleans instantly rose as if about to speak but at the urgent solicitation of those around her resumed her seat i call on the country to rally around this woman and this child cried m barreau the twofold representative of the principles of july thirty the voice of the speaker was drowned in shouts of dissent and of vive la reforme i dissent from the opinion of m odillon barreau cried the marquis de la roche jacquelin if he is right the people are nothing 
order order cried the president putting on his hat but he was at once induced to remove it at this moment another vast crowd burst into the chamber garbed in a style so heterogeneous as to be grotesque some with blouses some with dragoon helmets on their heads some with weapons and many with flags down 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 with the throne was the terrible cry of this infuriated mass i demand that the sitting be suspended cried m de mornay there can be no session at such a moment said the president putting on his hat off 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 with your hat president cried the populace and several of their muskets were at once pointed at the president the hat was removed the scene was chaos beware shouted m chevalier editor of the historical library beware how you make the count of paris king a provisional government we must first have what right have you to speak shouted a man you are not a deputy in the name of the people silence roared a terrific voice that drowned every other it was the voice of ledru rollin many of the deputies now withdrew and their places were filled by the people the duchess of orleans sat calmly amid the uproar and the duke of nemours with equal calmness stood behind her chair the throne has been tumbled from the windows of the tuileries and is now burning in the place de la bastille cried m du moulin who commanded the hotel de ville in july of thirty displaying the tricolor flag no more bourbons down with the bourbons down with the traitors a provisional government shouted the people ay a republic cried m chevalier cremieux ledru rollin and lamartine were at the same time in the tribune in the name of the people silence again roared the awful voice of ledru rollin a provisional government shouted one of the people you shall have a provisional government exclaimed m magouin in the name of the people in the name of the people of paris in arms again began ledru rollin i protest against this king and this regency the constitution of nine demands the will of the people to fix a regency yet the law of forty two makes the duke of nemours regent and now it is the duchess of orleans i protest against it all i demand a provisional government question question shouted m Berrier a provisional government in eighteen fifteen continued ledru rollin napoleon abdicated in favor of the king of rome the king of rome was refused in eighteen thirty charles the tenth abdicated in favor of his grandson the grandson was rejected in eighteen forty eight louis philippe abdicates in favor of his grandson the count of paris question question again vociferated m berrier we all know those histories in the name of the people continued ledru rollin i demand a provisional government named by the people not by the chamber but by the people tremendous shouts followed and m le martin who had stood beside rollin in the tribune now took his place amid renewed shouts after an eloquent speech on the same side as his friend he concluded by demanding a provisional government with an appeal to the people the entire people all who by the title of man have rights as men while lamartine was yet speaking a violent knocking was heard at the door of the chamber which was forcibly burst open and a vast crowd rushed in down with the chamber down with the deputies shouted the populace and muskets were instantly levelled at lamartine and also at the royal party it is lamartine it is lamartine was the cry of terror that rose from his friends the muskets were lowered the duchess and her party were at once withdrawn from the chamber by a side door and having first retired to the hotel des invalides next fled to the rhine the duke of nemours fled to boulogne and thence to england silence 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 shouted the president violently ringing his bell but the uproar only increased i pronounce this session closed cried the president and putting on his hat he instantly left the chair Here, ends the chamber of deputies a large number of the members withdrew with the president but the opposition remained and with them the people and the national guards after the noise incident to this departure had subsided the venerable m dupont de lure 
a gray-headed old man of eighty was by unanimous acclamation placed in the president's chair lamartine still remained in the tribune and repeatedly strove to make his voice heard but in vain in the name of the people silence and let lamartine speak at length was heard in the thunder tones of ledru rollin rising above all other sounds silence for a moment being obtained lamartine exclaimed citizens a provisional government is declared the names of the members will now be announced by the president lamartine then descended from the tribune applause and uproar succeeded the names of the members nominated for a provisional government i will now read to you said the aged president rising and displaying a paper the following names were then read and were repeated as they came one after the other from the speaker's mouth by the reporters in loud tones lamartine ledru rollin arago dupont de lure marie georges lafayette all were received with general approbation the members of the provisional government must be conducted by the people to the hotel de ville and installed cried a voice from the crowd let us adjourn to the hotel de ville lamartine at the head said m bocage immediately lamartine accompanied by a large number of citizens withdrew but a great multitude still remained upon the benches and in the semicircle of the chamber citizens cried ledru lorelin in nominating a provisional government you perform a solemn act an act which cannot be performed in a furious manner let me once more repeat to you the names you have chosen and as they are repeated you will say yes or no precisely as they please you i call on the reporters of the public press to note the names and the manner in which they are now received that france may know what is here done the names of dupont de lure arago lamartine ledru rollin cremieux garnier page and marie were then read out and all except the last two which were received with a few negatives were confirmed by unanimous acclamation the names were then engrossed in capitals on a sheet of paper and borne around the chamber on the bayonet of a national guard that all might read for themselves i have one more word to say cried ledru rollin the provisional government has immense duties to perform we must now close this meeting that the government may be able to restore order stanch the flow of blood and secure to the people their rights to the hotel de ville to the hotel de ville responded the people in a tremendous shout viva la république to the hotel de ville headed by ledru rollin the excited multitude withdrew and at four o'clock all was as silent in the chamber of deputies as if not a voice had resounded or a footstep had echoed within its walls for centuries in the distance however could be heard the repeated shout viva la république to the hotel de ville end of section twenty four section twenty five of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmund dantes by edmund flagg chapter twenty three the sack of the tuileries scarcely had the carriages conveying the royal family disappeared on their flight towards st cloud when the whole mass of the populace poured as with one simultaneous purpose into the deserted palace the palais bourbon had already been sacked a like fate might be supposed to await the tuileries but the tuileries belonged to france not to the house of orleans and a certain respect was observed for everything but the insignia of royalty for these was shown no regard the throne itself of the state reception-room that throne on which sat louis philippe for the first time as king of the french ere the tuileries became his throne was torn from its base and having been hurled first in derision from the windows into the court was borne in mock triumph on the shoulders of men who shouted that now the throne was indeed supported by the people to the place de la bastille and there consumed to ashes in the courtyard in the rue de rivoli and on the quays huge fires roared fanned into fury by a hurricane of wind 
and fed by richly carved furniture gilded chairs canopies pianos sofas beds costly paintings splendid works of art and the royal carriages glittering with gold the magnificent tapestries of the gobelins were borne as streamers in frantic fury along the boulevards the mischievous gamins were frolicking about in the long scarlet robes worn upon court occasions which they had filched from the royal wardrobe the esquitoire of the king the key having been found in a teacup was ransacked and private letters books and the garments of ladies were strewn about the court and gardens of the tuileries the cellars of the palace were soon filled with the insurgents but they declared the wine bad as it never remained long enough in the cellars of kings to get good destruction not pillage seemed the order of the hour and to guard against robbery the people took upon themselves the arrest and punishment of offenders the walls bore the menace robbers shall die in several instances the threat was carried into immediate execution and bodies suffered to lie on the spot upon which they had been cut down bore on their breasts the label thief in terrible warning sentinels also stood at the gates and no one was allowed to leave the palace without rigorous search in the apartments of the duchess of orleans the table was found spread for the dinner of herself and her children upon the table were the little silver cups forks and spoons of the young princes and on the floor were scattered their costly toys the latter were gathered carefully up by a workman in a blouse and as carefully concealed in a corner the former together with all jewels and other valuables found in the apartments of the duchess were deposited in a bathing tub on which a workman seated himself as guard and suffered no one to approach until the aforesaid valuables could be conveyed by a detachment of the polytechnic school to the government treasury the story runs that on the night succeeding the sack of the tuileries the conquerors chose a king and queen and that in the palace hall was spread a banquet composed of the viands found in the royal kitchen and the wines found in the royal cellars the queen who was a soubrette more noticeable for beauty than for cleanliness of person garbed in royal robes which she well became and with a coronet upon her stately brow was seated in a chair of state and received the most extravagant homage from her willing subjects while groups of gamins in the long crimson liveries of the royal household boisterously frolicked before the saint culat court amid roars of merriment End of section twenty five Section 26 of Edmond Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Castleberry, Detroit, Michigan. LarryCastleberry.com. Edmond Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter 24 A Memorable Night. Generally, the rogues throughout Paris intimidated by the awful immediate and certain penalty for crime forsook for the time their calling a man who attempted to fire the palais royal was shot at the prefecture another for a like attempt on buildings in the rue monceau made a like fate in the richelieu lay the bodies of two thieves each with a ball through the breast and over the aperture the word thief on a label in like manner were eight more robbers executed at once on the place de Medellin. A woman of the street wrested a bracelet from a lady's wrist. She was instantly seized by the bystanders and shot. But for the summary punishment of malefactors by the people, dreadful that night would have been the state of Paris without laws to enforce or a police to enforce them. It is true the Chateau of Neuilly was sacked and burned, as well as the splendid villa of the Baron Rothschild at Perennes but both were supposed to be the property of the king. It is true also that some rails on the northern railway were torn up, in a viaduct between Paris and Amiens, and another between Amiens and the frontier of Belgium were demolished, and that the railway station at St. Denis en Guienne and Pontéis and the bridge at Asnières had been destroyed. But all this was done to prevent the concentration upon the citizens of Paris of additional royal troops. 
A workman entered a house and demanded bread. Meat and wine were offered him. No was the reply. Bread and water are all I want. Yet such was the scarcity of food that horses were killed and eaten at the Hotel de Villa on the third day of the revolution. Arms! Arms! shouted a band of workmen, entering a house on the Richelieu. The proprietor, alarmed, shouted for help. Do you think us robbers? was the indignant reply. Give us your weapons! The weapons were given, and the band retired. On the door they wrote, Here we received arms. At five o'clock on the evening of the 24th of February, a proclamation to the citizens of Paris issued by the provisional government, then in session at the Hotel de Villa, declared the revolution accomplished. The 80,000 of the National Guard and 100,000 of the people were in arms. That order as well as liberty must now be secured, and the people with the National Guard were appointed guardians of Paris. The effect of this proclamation was magical. Never was Paris so well protected as on that night of the 24th of February, when, filled with barricades, she had no police and was guarded by her citizens. And how was constituted the provisional government whose power was thus implicitly obeyed? It was founded by the people who obeyed it. This was the only secret. From the Chamber of Deputies to the Hotel de Villa proceeded the members of the provisional government. They marched under a canopy of sabers, pikes, and bayonets into halls stained with blood and encumbered with the slain. And there, at a small table, while the conflict between the two republics had already commenced, Within an hour had they organized their body by the nomination of Armand Maras of the Nationale, Ferdinand Flocon of La Reforme, Albert, a workman, and Louise Blanc, the editor and author, as secretaries of the government. Their first official act was to issue a proclamation to the people. The scenes witnessed the night which succeeded in Paris would never be forgotten by those who witnessed them. Patrols promenaded the streets. The men of the barricades slept upon their weapons. Beside their works and through all that night ceaselessly toiled the press to spread over all the world the news of the great events of the three past days in Paris. Upon the door of an edifice situated in the Rue Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a street which was filled with barricades of immense size and strength, was posted a printed placard. The provisional government, lighted by a single lamp, entering the door with a vast multitude, in ascending the dark and winding staircase, you found yourself in a large room, dimly lighted and crowded with armed men. It was the editorial apartment of the office of Les Reformes. At a large and massive table sat a dozen persons most industriously employed in writing. Around them, looking on, rose the rough, stern faces of the men of the barricades, seeming still more rough and stern by reason of the shadowy light, and the hands of all were weapons. A copy of the name of the members of the provisional government was the incessant demand of these armed men, a demand which the dozen writers at the table were unable, even by most indefatigable industry, to supply as fast as made. And as fast as the demand was satisfied, the armed men would hurry away, only to leave the room for the crowds constantly entering. A copy for the Hotel de Billa, cried one. A copy for the Place Bendome, shouted another. A copy for the Palais Bourbon, screamed a third. Are there no printed copies left? asked many. They were gone long ago. Twenty thousand copies, was the reply. You will see one at every corner. The demand was not expected. The printers have just gone to sleep. They had not rested for fifty-two hours. Will our reforme appear in the morning? asked another. Perhaps so, was the answer. But all the people are worn out, writers and compositors. Here is your copy of the names. Many thanks. Vive la République. With this shout, in concert with the same which constantly issued from a hundred lips, the citizens folded up his precious document and carefully depositing it in his cap, hurried off to communicate its contents to his comrades of the neighboring barricade. In another apartment of that same edifice were a large number of the Republican Party connected with Les Reformes. The provisional government is now in session, said one. They will doubtless make immediate provision for departments of states so important as the post office and the prefecture of police. Early tomorrow, a proclamation, tomorrow may be too late, interrupted a large and muscular man. 
the post office is more active than ever tonight. Every moment couriers are arriving and departing. That powerful instrument remains in the hands of the foes of our cause. Who may estimate the injury, the irreparable injury which they may this night accomplish by its means? This man was Atien Arago, brother of the great astronomer, and for 16 years celebrated as one of the boldest members of the Republican Party, as well as one of the bravest men in Paris. And the prefecture of police, observed another, the present utter derangement of all its functions may lead to most serious results. Already those foes of freedom, Gazut and his colleagues, have been suffered to secure their escape from the just indignation of an outraged people. De la Certe, the prefect, has also fled. The man who said this was Marc Cassidier, a well-known Republican. Citizens, cried Monsieur Guachi, this state of things must continue no longer. In the name of the people, I demand that Atian Arago immediately assume the charge of the post office as its director and that Marc Castier fill the position of prefect. This demand was confirmed by acclamation and committees for the installation of the nominees into office at once accompanied them to their respective departments. The immense edifice of the post office was surrounded by people and its numerous windows were flashing with lights. Within the utmost activity seemed to prevail and without couriers were leaving and arriving every moment, and mail coaches were dashing up to discharge their burdens, or, having received them, were dashing off. In the name of the people, entrance for citizen Etienne Arago, Republican director of the post office, shouted one of the committee. Instantly, a passage through the immense crowd in the courtyard was cleared by the National Guard, and the director entered with his escort. In the name of the people, citizen Dijon, you are dismissed, said Atiana Rago, entering the private cabinet of the director general. And who is to be my successor, said the astonished count, rising to his feet. In the name of the people, I am sent to displace and to succeed you, was the answer. But your commission, monsieur, is here, pointing to the committee. Before I resign the direction of this department, said the count after some hesitation, I must ask of you for some record of this act, bearing your signature to be deposited in the archives of the office. Certainly, monsieur, your request is but reasonable, answered Arago, seating himself in the official chair and writing a few lines to which he affixed his signature. He coolly handed the document to his astonished predecessor. It contained notice of his own appointment by the people in place of the Count de Gene, dismiss. The Count read and folded the paper, and having made a copy of it, which he laid carefully in his porte manier, he placed the original on file among the papers of the day belonging to the department. Then, courteously bowing, he took his hat and cane and marched out of the building. End of section 26. Recording by Larry Castleberry, Detroit, Michigan. LarryCastleberry.com Section 27 of Edmond Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edmond Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter 25 The Provisional Government. In the Hotel de Ville, closely closeted, sat the Provisional Government of France. Over that stern old citadel, over the dismantled palace of the Tuileries, from the tall summit of the Column of Vendôme, over the Hôtel des Invalides, and in the Place de la Bastille, is seen a blood-red banner, streaming out like a meteor on the keen northwestern blast. Eighty thousand armed men invest the Hôtel de Ville, and wave on wave, wave on wave the living and stormy tide eddies and welters and dashes around that dark old pile all its avenues are held its courts are thronged ordnance frowns from its black portals and against its gates drums roll banners stream bayonets glitter and from those tens of thousands of hoarse and stormy voices goes up but one shout of menace and command 
viva la république viva la république no kings no bourbons down down forever with the kings and upward to that dark old pile of despotism as to the temple of liberty herself are turned those tens of thousands of swarthy faces dark with the smoke of battle yet livid with excitement and exhaustion and as they realize that within those walls the question of their fate and that of their country is then being settled that from that night's councils in that vast and ancient edifice are to flow peace and prosperity and freedom and plenty or else all the untold terrors of anarchy civil war bloodshed violence and strife what wonder that the sitting of the councils seemed endless and their own impatience became intolerable that all imaginable doubts and fears and absurd apprehensions took possession of their inflamed imaginations that at one time the rumour should fly and when credence as it flew that the provisional government were consulting with the friends of henry v or again that they were considering the question of a regency and that under such influences they should roar and yell and thunder for admission at the gates and burden the air with their shouts no bourbon no kings no regency death death to all kings la république la république la république at times in terrific concert would the thousands of uplifted throats roar forth the chorus of that startling canticle of ninety two vive la république vive la république debout peuple francais debout peuple héorique debout peuple francais vive la république then the song would change and the mournful notes of the death hymn of the girondins mourir pour la patrie would swell in wild yet solemn cadence on the wintry blast death hymn of the girondins by the voice of the signal cannon france calls her sons their aid to lend let us go the soldier cries to battle tis our mother we defend to die on freedom's altar to die on freedom's altar tis the noblest of fates who to meet it would falter we who fall afar from the battle lone and unknown obscurely die but give at least our parting blessings unto france and freedom high to die on freedom's altar to die on freedom's altar tis the noblest of fates who to meet it would falter and thus all that terrible night even until the morning's dawn thronged those men of the barricades around the hotel de ville and all the night even until the morning's dawn calmly continued those men of the provisional government of the french republic amid menace and mandate uproar and confusion in their noble yet arduous work at midnight a proclamation of the provisional government was read by torchlight to the excited masses by louis blanc from the steps of the hotel de ville declaring for a government of the people by itself with liberty equality and fraternity for its principles while order was devised and maintained by the people which served somewhat to allay their apprehensions and distrust this proclamation appeared in all the morning journals and was placarded all over the city the next day that day was friday the twenty fifth of february but still the provisional government remained in session and still the armed masses of the barricades in congregated thousands rolled in tumultuous billows around the hotel de ville at length the populace exasperated by impatience hunger and sleeplessness with brandished bayonets rushed into the very chamber of council with furious cries and with threats which were well nigh accomplished again and again at the entreaty 
of his colleagues did the brave the eloquent the wise lamartine present himself upon the steps of the hôtel de ville to assuage and quiet the rising tempest again and again throughout that fearful day did he come forth single-handed to wrestle with violence turbulence anarchy and strife and again and again beneath the magic of his eloquent tongue the storm lulled the tempest ceased again and again throughout all that fearful day were the acts of that noble government matured and sent forth proclamation followed proclamation and no branch of society seemed forgotten the names of the members of the provisional government were again published Cossidiere and sobrier were confirmed in the police department and etienne arago in that of the post office merchants of provisions were recommended to supply all who were in need and the people were recommended to still retain their arms the chamber of deputies was dissolved the peers were forbidden to meet and the convocation of a national assembly was promised to all labourers labour was guaranteed and compensation for labour at noon the garrison of the fort of vincennes was announced to have acknowledged the republic just as the people were about to march upon it to ensure order and tranquillity the municipal guard was disbanded and the national guard entrusted with the protection of paris under m courtet the commandant who was ordered immediately to recruit twenty-four battalions for active service all articles pledged at the mont de piete from february fourth not exceeding in value ten francs were ordered to be returned and the tuileries was decreed the future asylum of invalid workmen an attack on the machinery of some of the printing offices was checked by a proclamation general bedeau was appointed minister of war general cavignac governor of algeria and admiral baudin to the command of the toulon fleet on the part of the army marshal bougeot and on the part of the clergy the venerable archbishop of paris gave in their adhesion to the republic while the entire press bourgeoisie and the province hesitated not an instant indeed from all quarters came in adhesions to the republic the bonapartes were among the first barreau and tier also came but too late to save themselves from contempt mr rush the american minister the first of foreign ambassadors acknowledged the republic the son of mehemet ali was next the papal nuncio succeeded together with the ministers of the argentine republic and uruguay next came the ambassador of england but those of austria prussia russia and holland awaited instructions from home little dreaming of the news they were about to receive the city of rouen sent three hundred of its citizens as a deputation with abundant supplies of arms by the morning cars of the railway at about noon the pont louis philippe was destroyed by fire henceforth it is to be le pont de la réforme and so with all other names royal is to give place to république and libitaire égalité et fraternité is to be again inscribed on all public monuments the children of citizens killed in the revolution were declared adopted by the country the civil judicial and administrative functionaries of the royal government were announced released from their oaths of office the colonels of the twelve legions of national guards were dismissed and all political prisoners set free every citizen was declared an elector and absolute freedom of thought the liberty of the press and the right of political and industrial associations secured to all were proclaimed a warrant for the arrest of the late ministers was issued by the new procureur-general m portali based on an act of accusation presented to the court of appeals but all of them had fled guizot is said to have escaped from the foreign office in a servant's livery when the people broke into his hotel they found only his daughter and retired 
the other members of the ministry are said to have leaped from a low window of the tuileries and to have escaped at the moment of the king's abdication m de cormenin was appointed conseilleur d'etat and m achille maras procureur general to the court of appeals in paris in place of the refugees such were some of the acts of the seven men constituting the provisional government of the french republic during their first extraordinary session of sixty-four hours from the hour of four o'clock in the afternoon of thursday after the dissolution of the chamber of deputies to the hour of four o'clock in the morning of sunday the twenty seventh of february when the people of paris consented to retire to their homes but during all of this period night and day without intermission every moment was the hotel de ville surrounded by tumultuous masses infuriated by suspicion apprehension and distrust for two whole days and two whole nights armed men incessantly inundated the square the courts and halls of the hotel de ville they insisted on giving to the republic the character the attitude and the emblems of the first revolution they insisted on a republic violent sweeping dictatorial and terrorist in language in gesture and in colour in place of that determined on moderate pacific legal unanimous and constitutional at the peril of their lives the provisional government resisted this demand twenty times during those sixty-four hours was lamartine taken up dragged carried to the doors and windows or to the head of the grand staircase into the courts and the square to hurl down with his eloquence those emblems of terrorism with which it was attempted to dishonour the republic but the vast and infuriated mass refused to listen and drowned his voice in clamour and vociferation at length when well-nigh exhausted in defence of the emblem of a moderate republic he exclaimed the red flag has been nowhere except around the champ de mars trailed in the blood of the people while the tricolour has been around the world with our navy our glory and our liberties the furious and hitherto obdurate and bloodthirsty populace became softened tears were shed arms were lowered flags were thrown away and peaceably they departed to their homes never never was there a more glorious triumph of eloquence of patriotism it was on the morning of sunday the twenty seventh day of february that the provisional government deemed it prudent and proper for them to bring to a close their initiative labours and once more for the last time lamartine descended the steps of the great staircase of the hotel de ville and presenting himself in front of the edifice surrounded by his colleagues announced to the vast assembly the result of their protracted toil royalty abolished a republic proclaimed the people restored to their political rights national workshops opened the army and national guard reorganized the abolition of death for political offences with louder and more prolonged acclamations than any other decree was this last received and instantly in accordance with this proclamation the director of criminal affairs on the order of m cremio minister of justice dispatched on the wings of the wind all over france the warrant to suspend all capital executions which were to have taken place in virtue of royal decrees until the will of the national assembly at once to be convened should be promulgated on the subject of the penalty of death the effects of this decree as it sped on the lightning's wings like a saving angel all over france may be imagined perhaps but portrayal is impossible who can imagine even the joy the rapture it brought to many a dungeon prisoner who was counting the hours that yet remained to him of life and preceded his awful doom or to those who sorrowed over his untimely perchance his unjust fate leaning on the arm of louis blanc the youngest member of the government the venerable dupont de lure 
the eldest accompanied by the other members now appeared on the balcony of the room formerly called the chamber of the throne but now the chamber of the republic lamartine then advanced a step before his colleagues and in a brief and eloquent address proclaimed to that immense throng the existence of the republic the announcement was received with acclamations of joy and shouts of viva le gouvernement viva lamartine viva louis blanc mingled with those of viva la république loudly rose from the hotel de ville the provisional government proceeded in a body despite the rain which fell in torrents accompanied by the people to the place de la bastille there officially to inaugurate the republic agreeably to announcement at the appointed hour the place de la bastille was thronged the national guard consisting of two battalions from each of the twelve legions of paris together with the thirteenth legion of cavalry and two battalions of the banlieue were drawn up from the church of the madeleine to the column of july and there at the base of that column erected in commemoration of the revolution which had made louis philippe king of the french his downfall was commemorated and on the ruins of the throne then established was now inaugurated a republic during the ceremony of the inauguration the marseillaise was sung by the national guard and the people and at its conclusion about the hour of three the troops filed off before the column of july to the thrilling strains of the marseillaise and the mourir pour la patrie of the girondins the members of the provisional government preceded by a detachment of the national guard and accompanied by the pupils of the polytechnic school and the military school of saint cyr then descended the boulevards followed by the whole of the military and civic array who chanted the national songs the effect was stupendous hour after hour the immense procession moved on like a huge serpent through the streets of paris and at length when its head was at the hotel de ville its extremity had hardly left the column of july it was night on sunday the twenty seventh of february when the members of the provisional government for the first time during four days returned to their homes but their work was accomplished a republic was gained proclaimed and inaugurated end of section twenty seven section twenty eight of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmund dantes by edmund flagg chapter twenty six dantes and mercedes it was a tempestuous night the wind howled dismally through the streets of paris and the rain and sleet dashed fiercely against the casements at intervals a wild shout might be caught as the blast paused in its furious career and then a distant shot might be heard but they passed away and nothing save the wail of the storm wind or the rushing sleet of the winter tempest was distinguished but while all was thus wild dark and tempestuous without light warmth comfort and elegance rendered yet more delightful by the elemental war reigned triumphant within a large and splendidly furnished apartment in the noble mansion of m dantes the deputy from marseilles in the rue de elder every embellishment which art could invent luxury court wealth invoke or even imagination conceive seemed there lavished with a most prodigal hand the soft atmosphere of summer perfumed by the exotics of a neighbouring conservatory delighted the senses the mild effulgence of gaslight transmitted through opaque globes of glass melted upon the sight while sofas divans and ottomans in luxurious profusion invited repose to describe the rare paintings the rich gems of statuary and the other miracles of art 
which were there to be seen would be as impossible as it would be to portray the exquisite taste which enhanced the value of each and constituted more than half its charm upon one of the elegant sofas reclined edmund dantes his tall and graceful figure draped in a dressing robe while beside him on a low ottoman sat his beautiful wife her arm resting on his knee and her dark glorious eyes gazing with confiding fondness into his face mercedes was no longer the young light-hearted and thoughtless being who graced the village of the catalans many years had flown since then and many sorrows passed over her each of these years and each of these sorrows like retiring waves of the sea upon the smooth and sandy beach had left behind its trace no mercedes was not now the young light-hearted and thoughtless girl she once was but she was a being far more perfect far more winning far more to be loved she was a matured impassioned accomplished and still despite the flight of years most lovely woman she was one who could feel passion as well as inspire it and having once felt or inspired it that passion it was plain could never pass lightly away her face could not now boast perhaps that full and perfect oval which it formerly had but the lines of care and of reflection which here and there almost imperceptibly appeared rendered it all the more charming in the bold yet beautiful contour of those features in the full red lips in the high pale forehead and above all in those dark and haunting eyes lay a depth of feeling and profundity and nobleness of thought which to a reflective mind have a charm infinitely more irresistible than that which belongs to mere youthful perfection there was a bland beauty in the smile which slept upon her lips a delicacy of sentiment in the faint flush that tinged her soft cheek and a deep meaning in her dark and eloquent eye which told a whole history of experience even to a stranger while the full and rounded outline of the figure garbed in a loose robe of crimson which contrasted beautifully with her luxuriant dark tresses had that voluptuous development and grace which only maturity and maternity can impart to the female form in short never had mercedes in the days of her primal bloom presented a person so fascinating as now she was a woman to sigh for perchance to die for and one whom a man would willingly wish to live for if he might but hope she would live for him or peradventure he might even be willing not only to risk but ultimately to resign his life would that fair being not only live for him but love him with that entire and passionate devotedness which beamed from her dark eyes up into his who now gazed upon her as she sat at his feet as for him as for edmund dantes his figure had now the same elegance his hand the same delicate whiteness his features the same spiritual beauty his brow the same marble pallor and his eye which beamed beneath its calm expanse the same deep brilliancy which years before had distinguished him from all other men and made the count of monte cristo the idol of every salon in paris and the hero of every maiden's dream yet that face was not without its changes tears care thought and sorrow had done their work in the deep lines upon his brow and cheek in the silvery threads which thickly sprinkled his night-black hair and more than all in the mild light of those eyes which once glowed only with vindictive hate or gratified revenge and in the softened expression of those lips which once in their stern beauty had but curled with scorn or quivered with rage could be read that the lapse of time though it might indeed have made him a sadder man had made him also a better one the husband and wife were alone they still loved as warmly as ever and if possible more fondly than when first they were made one dantes stretched himself out on the sofa and mercedes dropping lower upon the low ottoman at his side passed her full and beautiful arm around his waist and pressed her lips to his forehead 
he returned the embrace with warmth and placing his own arm about her form drew it closely to his bosom thus they remained clasped in each other's arms and thus they fixed on each other eyes beaming with love passion bliss happiness unutterable my own edmund murmured mercedes at length you are again with me all my own am i not always your own dearest was the fond reply but during the week past i might almost say during the month past you have been compelled to be so often absent from me ah love you know i was not willingly absent was the quick answer no 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 but it was hardly the more endurable for that said the lady with a smile oh the anxiety of the last three days and nights dearest i do believe i have not slept three hours during the whole of those three days and nights and i dear have slept not one was the laughing rejounder but all is over now is it not in one sense all is over and in another all now begins the monarchy is ended in france i believe for ever the republic has begun and i trust will prove lasting and all the grand objects for which you have been striving with your noble colleagues for years and years are at length accomplished are they not that is a question love not easily answered that the cause of man and france has wonderfully triumphed during the past three days is no doubt most true but this victory love i foresaw indeed it was but the inevitable result of an irresistible cause it was neither chance love nor a spontaneous burst of patriotism that on the first day filled the boulevards with fifty thousand blouses which on the second won over to the people eighty thousand national guards and on the third choked the streets of paris with barricades constructed by engineers and defended by men completely armed the events of the last three days mercedes have been maturing in the womb of providence for the past ten years it is their birth only which has now taken place and to some the parturition seems a little premature i suppose this banquet caused the fright that hastened the event added dantes laughing you are very scientific in your comparisons replied mercedes slightly blushing and i suppose i must admit very apt but tell me love is all over that is must you be away from me any more at night and wander about heaven only knows where in this dark and dangerous city or heaven only knows with whom or for what dantes kissed his fair wife and after a pause during which he gazed fondly into her eyes replied i hope i trust i believe dear that all is over at least all that will take me from you as during the past week france has or will have a republic that is as certain as fate can make it but first she will have to pass through strife and tribulation perhaps bloodshed the end surely love is not yet but france is now comparatively free the dreadful problem is now nearer solution than it ever was labor will hereafter be granted to all together with the adequate reward of labor destitution will not be deemed guilt the death penalty is abolished the rich will not with impunity grind the poor into powder beneath their heels asylums for the suffering the distress the abandoned of both sexes will be sustained the efforts which as individuals we have some of us made for years to ameliorate the condition of mankind to assuage human woes and augment human joys will henceforth be encouraged and directly aided by the state this revolution love is a social revolution and during the sixty-four hours the provisional government was in session in the hotel de ville i became thoroughly convinced that the thousands and tens of thousands who with sleepless vigilance watched their proceedings had learned the deep lesson too well to be further deceived and that the fruits of the revolution they had won would not again be snatched from their lips and the result of this triumph of the people you believe has advanced the cause of human happiness asked mercedes most unquestionably dear and most incalculably too perhaps 
all your friends are not as disinterested as you have been edmund said mercedes and why think you that dear for six full years i know you have devoted all your powers of mind and body and all your immense wealth to one single object and that object has been the happiness of your race well dear and now when a triumph has been achieved now when others who have been but mere instruments blind instruments many of them in your hands to accomplish they knew not what come forward and assume place and power you edmund the noble author and first cause of all remain quietly in seclusion unknown unnamed unappreciated and uncommended while the others reap the fruits of your toil well dear said dantes smiling at the warmth of his wife in his behalf but it is not well edmund i say no one is as disinterested as you ah love what of ambition mercedes smiled let me tell you all love and then you will not i fear think me disinterested said dantes seriously i should blush indeed at praise so little deserved you know all my early history i suffered i was wronged i was revenged but was i happy i sought happiness all men do so even the most miserable some seek happiness in gratified ambition some in gratified avarice some in gratified vanity and some in the gratification of a dominant lust for pleasure or for power i sought happiness in gratified revenge mercedes shuddered and hiding her face on the bosom of her husband clung to it more closely as if for protection dantes drew her form to his as he would have drawn that of a child and continued i sought happiness in vengeance for terrible wrongs and to win it i devoted a life and countless wealth what was the result misery 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 poor edmund murmured mercedes clinging to him closer than ever at length i awoke as from a dream i saw my error my whole life had been a lie i saw that god by a miracle had bestowed on me untold riches for a nobler purpose than to make his creatures wretched i saw that if i would be happy i must make others happy and to this end the happiness not the misery of my race must my wealth and power be devoted to this end then did i devote myself and to this end for six years have i been devoted to make myself happy by making others happy you among the rest dear dear mercedes he added pressing her to his bosom and am i then so disinterested but why should you achieve triumphs for others to enjoy edmund asked the wife you refer to the provisional government said dantes with a smile well i see i must tell you all even though by the revelation i prove myself utterly unworthy of the praise of disinterestedness i may tell you love you my second self without danger of being charged with egotism what i might not say to others our friend lamartine is the actual head of this government i had but to assent to the urgent entreaties to secure that position for myself these appointments seem the result of nomination by the people yet they are not and why did you refuse to head the government edmund i am ashamed to confess to you that i feared to accept said dantes after a pause my own selfishness not alas my disinterestedness has kept me from the post of peril perhaps indeed i can do far more for the cause of my race as i am than i could by sacrificing myself for office and position at least i hope so is the position of your friends then so perilous asked mercedes dearest they stand upon a volcano said dantes solemnly ha cried the lady in alarm mercedes mercedes continued dantes with enthusiasm i sometimes am startled with the idea that to me have been entrusted the awful powers of foreknowledge of prophecy so fearfully true have some of my predictions proved the events of the past week i foresaw and foretold even 
to minute circumstances and the hours of their occurrence and now glorious as is the triumph that france and the cause of man have achieved i perceive in the dim future a sea of commotion all is not yet settled within one month revolution will succeed revolution throughout europe berlin vienna and madrid perhaps also st petersburg london and all the cities of italy will be in revolt all europe must and will feel the events of the past week in paris europe must be free and our friends lamartine louis blanc within six months louis blanc will be in exile and lamartine he may be in a dungeon or on a scaffold ah exclaimed mercedes clinging yet more closely to her husband but the cause of human happiness human right and human freedom will live for ever that must be will be eternal as eternal my adored mercedes as is our own deathless love end of section twenty eight section twenty nine of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmund dantes by edmund flagg chapter twenty seven esperance and zuleika during the whole period of the memorable revolution zuleika never once saw her brother though she was burning with a desire to have an interview with him on the subject that had caused the separation between her young italian lover and herself esperance made his home behind the barricades from the time the struggle began until the people finally triumphed gun in hand he fought as heroically as the most devoted workman fearlessly exposing himself whenever the troops pressed his comrades in arms and always in the thick of the fight begrimed with dust and powder his garments torn by bullets and bayonet thrusts his hat battered and rent he encouraged the people by word and example constantly shouting viva la republique and contending for liberty with the bravery of a lion and a persistency that never flagged he however escaped without a single scratch returning to the paternal mansion utterly worn out but altogether unhurt proud of having done his duty as a man and a patriot and of having sustained the glorious cause for which his father was working heart and soul as he was slowly and wearily wending his way homeward he suddenly encountered m dantes and his friend lamartine in the rue richelieu his gun was on his shoulder and in his tattered attire with the dust and powder on his face and hands he had the exact appearance of an insurrectionist and a barricader he touched his hat in military fashion to m dantes and his illustrious companion and was about passing on when his father recognized him and ragged and begrimed as he was threw his arms enthusiastically about his neck m lamartine watched the deputy from marseilles and could not restrain an expression of astonishment at his singular behaviour m dantes smiled and taking esperance by the hand said Monsieur lamartine you will i know make every allowance for me when you learn that this young man who has been fighting behind the barricades with the people is my son the head of the provisional government instantly grew as enthusiastic as mr dantes himself he grasped esperance's free hand and shaking it with the utmost cordiality exclaimed your son monsieur dantes let me congratulate you why he is a perfect hero i have but followed my father's teachings and done what he would have done had he been my age and unable to serve the great cause of human freedom in a more effective way m dantes eyes sparkled with joy and a faint shade of colour appeared upon his pale cheeks what is your name young patriot asked m lamartine his excitement and enthusiasm continuing to hold possession of him esperance was the reply esperance hope the name is both appropriate and auspicious with such heroic young men as you fighting for our cause there is indeed hope and of the brightest and best kind cried lamartine 
nay nay said m dantes do not flatter the boy he has but done his duty believe me i do not flatter him returned lamartine i have simply told him the truth in time he will rival the devotion and achievements of his noble father enough enough said the deputy modestly we deserve only the credit of executing god's will we are merely instruments in his omnipotent hand he added impressively and such instruments are exactly what we need in the present crisis god grant us plenty of them the next morning zuleika encountered esperance on the stairway she led him into the salon and when they were seated said my brother i have a question to ask of you a shadow crossed the young man's brow and he quickly asked is it about the viscount massetti yes then i must refuse to answer but the matter concerns my happiness nay my very life itself think of that before you finally refuse to answer my question espérance hastily and excitedly arose from his chair and stood in front of his sister zuleika said he in an agitated tone beware of that man beware of giovanni massetti beware of giovanni espérance and why the young man began to pace the salon with short and nervous steps his hands twitched convulsively and his face had suddenly assumed the whiteness of chalk zuleika zuleika he murmured i cannot i cannot tell you why it would crash you to the very earth and make you blush with shame that you had ever listened to the seductive tones of that doubly false italian's voice but esperance said zuleika papa certainly knows all about giovanni if he did not altogether approve of his character and conduct he would never have consented to admit him as a suitor for my hand a suitor for your hand zuleika my god has he then dared he has done nothing that an upright and honourable man should not do interrupted zuleika warmly he did not even call here until he had written to papa and obtained his full permission to do so zuleika said esperance approaching his sister and taking her hand no doubt giovanni massetti has conducted himself in all respects toward you like a perfect gentleman but nevertheless he is not fit to be my sister's husband but papa has been deceived as have many others in regard to the true character and standing of this so-called roman nobleman and is he not a nobleman once more i must refuse to answer any question in regard to him i can only tell you to beware and shun him as you would a venomous serpent esperance i love him love him you love him zuleika oh this is indeed torture the young man dropped his sister's hand and flung himself upon a divan he was a prey to the most intense excitement zuleika deeply affected to see him thus and remembering giovanni's mysterious behaviour together with his strange and ominous words when she had questioned him in regard to his quarrel with espérance felt for a moment shaken and uncertain she also recollected that at the time of the inexplicable difficulty between the two young men she had heard rumours to the effect that a youthful member of the roman aristocracy had abducted a beautiful peasant girl in which affair he had been assisted by the notorious brigand luigi vampa the matter however had almost immediately been hushed up and she had learned none of the circumstances could it be possible that giovanni massetti was the youthful aristocrat alluded to by the gossips and scandal-mongers of the eternal city that he was the abductor of the unfortunate peasant girl she could not entertain such an idea and yet that abduction in spite of all her efforts would associate itself with her italian lover in her mind she arose from her chair and going to the divan seated herself beside espérance determined to make a final attempt to draw his secret from him throwing her arms tenderly about his neck she said in a coaxing tone if any sound reason exists why i should not love giovanni massetti and you know it your plain duty as my brother is to tell me will you not tell me espérance instead of replying the young man buried his face in his hands and fairly sobbed in his anguish zuleika was filled with pity for him and as she gazed at him tears came into her eyes but still bent on discovering the nature of the obstacle that had so suddenly loomed up between giovanni and herself she continued after a pause in the same coaxing voice esperance i am no longer a child and should not be treated as one what i ask of you is only reasonable and just 
if i stand on the brink of a gulf i cannot see it is your duty to inform me not only of my danger but also of its nature am i not right heaving a deep sigh espérance replied yes you are right zuleika it is my duty to tell you all and yet i cannot at least tell me why you are compelled to maintain silence on a matter of so much importance did you question the viscount i did and what answer did he return like you he refused to answer ah then he has some sense of shame left shame yes shame and what did you do when he refused to speak i left him and you will not see him again not until he has decided to tell me all then you will never put eyes upon him more he dare not tell you dare not and why because did you know the depth of his infamy you would spurn him from you suddenly a grave suspicion stole into zuleika's mind and made her tremble from head to foot might it not be that espérance had been as deeply involved in the mysterious and infamous affair of which he declined to speak as giovanni massetti himself the thought was torment and totally unable to restrain her keen anxiety to be instantly informed upon this topic zuleika gasped out were you not espérance as guilty as your former friend the young man leaped to his feet as if a tarantula had bitten him no no cried he i was innocent of all blame in the matter luigi vampa he abruptly checked himself and stood staring at his sister as if in dismay at having unguardedly uttered the brigand's name but zuleika said nothing giovanni massetti also had protested his innocence and the young girl knew not what to believe luigi vampa so then he had been a party to this mysterious and terrible business whatever it was and again she thought of the abduction of the beautiful peasant girl could that be the fearful secret yes it must be luigi vampa had assisted in that abduction if report could be relied on and the chief criminal had been a youthful member of the roman aristocracy oh it was all plain now zuleika shuddered and felt her heart grow heavy as lead while a sharp killing pang ran through it had espérance been misled by vampa and the viscount had he discovered too late the infamy of the affair and challenged massetti on that account this was doubtless the solution of the whole enigma and yet zuleika hesitated to accept it as such no no she could not accept it without further and more convincing proof but how was that proof to be obtained neither the viscount nor her brother would speak it was evident that their lips were sealed possibly an oath to maintain silence had been extorted from them under terrible circumstances an oath they feared to break even to clear themselves from a foul suspicion but vampa he might perhaps be induced to give the key to the mystery vampa however was far away in rome and inaccessible zuleika made a wild resolve she would write to the brigand and throw herself upon his generosity then she decided that the plan was impracticable her letter would never reach vampa it would be seized by the roman authorities and might cause additional trouble by reviving a smothered scandal and even should it reach the brigand would he answer it the chances were a hundred to one that he would not at this instant an inspiration came to the tortured girl like a flash of lightning her father had known vampa in the past and perhaps still possessed some influence over him she had heard the story of albert de morcerf's adventure in the catacombs of st sebastian and was aware that the brigand chief had released him from captivity without ransom at her father's simple solicitation would not vampa answer her questions if m dantes could be influenced to write him and ask them she had full faith in her father's power to get a letter to the bandit notwithstanding all the vigilance of the roman authorities yes she would go to him tell all her suspicions without reserve and beg him to write the letter it was hardly likely he would refuse he could not he must not thus resolved zuleika looked her brother full in the face and said calmly i see i torture you with my questions espérance that for some reason best known to yourself you cannot answer them 
and that it is useless to torment you further but something must be done and that at once i am going to my father espérance caught her wildly by the arm you are mad cried he it is you who are mad you and giovanni i tell you i am going to my father if you are innocent you have nothing to fear from any revelation i may make with these words she freed herself from her brother's grasp and quitted the salon leaving espérance standing in the centre of the apartment as if he were rooted to the spot end of section twenty nine Section 30 of Edmond Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edmond Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter 28 Captain Joliet's Love. In a small, cosy, and elegant suite of apartments in a mansion on the rue des capucines resided mademoiselle louise d'armilly and her brother leon as has already been stated the celebrated cantatrice had retired from the boards in consequence of having inherited a fortune of several millions of francs from the estate of her deceased father who rumour asserted had been a very wealthy parisian banker leon had abandoned the stage simultaneously with his sister who had invited him to share her suddenly acquired riches for strange to say the banker had not bequeathed to him a single sou the immense inheritance had been a complete surprise to mademoiselle d'armilly and for some time she had hesitated to accept it as a condition imposed by the will was her immediate withdrawal from her operatic career and the prima donna was as ambitious as gifted but finally she had yielded to the persuasive eloquence of the notary and the earnest entreaties of her friends cancelling all her engagements and with them abandoning her bright professional future the director of the academie royale demanded a large sum to release the artiste from her contract with him and this was paid by the notary with an alacrity that seemed to suggest he was not acting solely according to the directions of the will but was influenced by some personage who chose to remain in the background the notary also paid all other demands made by the various operatic managers who claimed they would lose by mademoiselle d'armilly's failure to appear these amounts were not deducted from the legacy a circumstance that gave additional colour to the supposition that the will of the deceased banker was not the sole factor in the celebrated cantatrice's good luck one evening shortly after paris had again quieted down mademoiselle d'armilly was seated in the little apartment that served her as a salon and with her was her brother leon the contrast between the pair seemed intensified in private life louise had that dark imperious majestic beauty usually possessed by brunettes her figure was full and finely developed her black eyes had the deep intense fire of passion and her faultless countenance glowing with health and loveliness indicated at once firmness decision and caprices without number leon on the contrary was delicate and feminine in appearance he had exceedingly small feet and hands and a single glance at his strikingly handsome face was sufficient to convince any experienced judge of human nature that he possessed a mild and yielding disposition the young man bore not the remotest family likeness to his sister and it was difficult to realize that they could be in any way related leon quitted his sister and going to a piano that stood in one corner of the apartment softly opened it and commenced lightly running his fingers over the keys then he seated himself at the instrument and played an air from lucrezia borgia with brilliancy and effect that only a finished performer could attain at the first notes louise arose and approaching the piano stood beside the player her eyes sparkling with appreciation and delight so absorbed were the brother and sister that they did not hear a soft knock at the door and only at the conclusion of the air did they realize that a visitor was in the apartment leon sprang from the instrument in confusion behaving like a startled girl 
but mademoiselle d'armilly with perfect self-control turned to the newcomer and said in a tone of mingled coquetry and merriment so so captain joliette your military career has accustomed you to surprising the enemy to such an extent that it has become second nature with you and you cannot avoid carrying your favourite tactics even into private life captain joliette for it was indeed he bowed and answered with a smile you must allow me solemnly to protest against classing yourself and your brother with the enemy you are both of you very dear friends especially louise said leon with a sly look and a pretty little ringing laugh leon leon when will you learn wisdom exclaimed mademoiselle d'armilly a blush mantling her visage and adding to its voluptuous beauty never i suppose returned her brother still laughing but i am already well acquainted with the value of discretion and therefore will withdraw as he uttered those words leon kissed the tips of his fingers to louise and joliette and lightly ran from the salon when he had disappeared the captain folded mademoiselle d'armilly in his arms and kissed her tenderly upon the forehead oh louise said he enthusiastically i love you more and more every day the former artiste gently disentangled herself from his embrace and smiling archly led him to a chair then she sat down upon another at a short distance from him no no said joliette warmly come and sit beside me on the sofa even leon sees that i adore you and all my friends in paris are aware that i am seeking your hand in marriage why will you be so formal and distant with me she arose and did as he requested joliet seated at her side put his arm about her waist louise did not resist but still maintained an air of coquetry that was displeasing to the ardent young soldier albert she said in a low musical voice do you indeed love me as you say love you louise cried joliet i would lay down my life for you are you quite sure you love me for myself and not because of the resemblance you say i bear to the woman you once so ardently admired what was her name ah eugenie danglars said she looking at him with a piercing gaze quite sure louise quite sure besides mademoiselle danglars has disappeared has not been seen or heard of for several years and no doubt is dead and yet you do not mourn for her how strange i never loved her as i love you louise eugenie danglars was a capricious and eccentric girl and had she lived would have been a capricious and eccentric woman it was well for me she vanished when she did but by the way another singular and inexplicable coincidence is that louise d'armilly the name you bear was also the name of mademoiselle danglars music teacher i cannot understand it at all there is no necessity for you to understand it anyhow it is a coincidence as you say nothing more well louise let us speak no further about either the resemblance or the coincidence suffice it that i love you and you alone that i love you for yourself your words make me very happy albert replied mademoiselle d'armilly and her full red lips looked so luscious ripe and alluring that joliette could not resist the temptation to bestow a long burning kiss upon them be my wife then dearest louise cried the captain and i will prolong your happiness until death shall strike me down ah albert men are so fickle they become infatuated with women and declare and no doubt think they could pass their lives at their charmer's feet but possession dulls the lustre of the brightest jewel and the devoted lover is speedily replaced by a careless if not faithless husband who instead of making his wife happy as he has sworn to do forsakes her side to bask in the smiles of sirens it will never be so with me my own my love protested joliet kissing her again and again i swear it i know the value of a lover's oath albert murmured louise with a meaning look when i was the brightest operatic star of the day many of them were breathed in my ear but they were trifles light as air forgotten as soon as uttered besides should i consent to become your wife you would be forced to leave me in france and return to africa in obedience to the call of duty 
the lovely women of algeria are prodigal of their beauties and endearments and under the spell of some subtle arab enchantress you would either forget poor louise d'armilly altogether or remember her only as a clog upon your pleasures and amorous delights nay nay you wrong me among all the dusky sirens of algeria there exists not one who could make me forget you for a single instant they are brazen shameless women who love with a recklessness and boldness that can only disgust a frenchman but they can dazzle even a frenchman render him delirious with passion and ere he is aware weave a web around him through which he cannot break my heart tells me you are as susceptible to feminine wiles as the rest of your countrymen and that perhaps you have already had half a dozen love affairs in algeria oh louise louise it grieves me to the soul that you can thus doubt me give me a chance to prove my love and you shall be more than satisfied that i can be loyal and true mademoiselle d'armilly gazed at him with a singular expression on her dark beautiful countenance it thrilled him to the very marrow of his bones and caused his arm that was about her waist to tremble violently at that moment the former cantatrice resembled eugenie danglars more than ever her breath was hot and convulsive as it struck his cheek and a faint suspicion that all was not right that she was playing a role with him shot across his mind for the first time with this suspicion came jealousy and releasing her waist he said in a gasping tone you have another lover louise a lover you prefer to me am i not right mademoiselle d'armilly laughed a short nervous laugh and answered in a voice that seemed to mock him i have had hosts of ardent admirers in my time do you refer particularly to any individual i know not i am beside myself with passion for you and the mere fancy that another man may have the first place in your heart is unbearable to me but there is one conclusive way in which you can prove my suspicion my jealousy groundless marry me albert replied louise with a renewal of the singular expression of countenance that had so agitated him i shall never marry any one i cannot i dare not the young man was startled as if by an electric shock he drew back and gazed at her with wide-opened eyes speechless from astonishment after a brief pause mademoiselle d'armilly continued in a dry hard tone you do not understand me and i cannot expect you to for i can neither tell you my motives nor lay bare my sad history to you you must be content with my decision i shall not marry captain joliette strong man as he was could not control his emotion he buried his face in his hands and groaned aloud the young woman gazed at him half pityingly half triumphantly she felt compassion for her stricken lover but above all gloried in the overwhelming power of her charms that could so subdue a manly victorious young soldier and make him her helpless slave is there then no shadow of a hope at length asked joliette in a hoarse whisper not the shadow of a hope replied mademoiselle d'armilly firmly you can be my friend my brother if you will but never my husband the young man recoiled in horror at the suggestion that seemed to be conveyed by this permission what do you mean by friend he asked a cold shiver passing through him louise laughed a short nervous laugh and looking him full in the eyes replied you know what i mean i love you better than any man i ever met save one captain joliette slowly arose to his feet and stood staring at her his passion and his scruples waging a bitter battle within him for the mastery the temptress half reclined on the sofa a miracle of seductive grace and voluptuous beauty he moved toward her as if to seize her in his arms then suddenly checking himself he asked with a convulsive gasp and that man that one was separated from me for ever through the vile machinations of that mysterious and cold-blooded fiend the count of monte cristo the count of monte cristo exclaimed the young man lost in amazement yes the count of monte cristo who afterwards disappeared from paris and has not since been heard of you mistake the count of monte cristo is in paris now he calls himself edmond dantes and is the celebrated deputy from marseilles over whom everybody has gone wild for some time past 
mademoiselle d'armilly's eyes flashed with fury then i will have my revenge upon him at last she cried i will amply repay him for introducing the so-called prince cavalcanti into my father's house and thus breaking off the match between albert and myself albert yes albert de morcerf now eugenie danglars i know you and it is useless for you to attempt the denial of your identity longer the young woman leaped up from the sofa with terror pictured upon her visage and seizing captain joliette by the arm with a powerful grasp cried out and how pray do you know i am eugenie danglars you unwittingly betrayed yourself by revealing the names of monte cristo and cavalcanti besides eugenie look at me well i am albert de morcerf with a wild cry the retired prima donna sank back upon the sofa you albert de morcerf she exclaimed i cannot believe it but my mother the former countess de morcerf who is now the wife of edmond dantes will vouch for my identity the young woman passed her hand across her forehead as if dazed if you are albert de morcerf you must despise me after what has taken place this evening she said bitterly despise you no i pity and forgive you albert said she softly come here and sit beside me on this sofa i have something to say to you the soldier obeyed when he was seated he said eugenie why did you tell me i could be your friend simply because i have long suspected your secret and wished to ascertain the real nature of your feelings toward me you not only resisted a terrible temptation the most terrible temptation to which a young ardent and passion-smitten man can be exposed but by your honour conclusively established the purity and sincerity of your love o oh, albert albert are you satisfied with my explanation and do you still think me worthy of you my own eugenie my happiness is far too great for words murmured the delighted young man gathering his beautiful companion in a warm embrace and repeatedly kissing her ripe lips and blushing cheeks it was soon known throughout paris that captain joliette and albert de morcerf were identical and that mademoiselle d'armilly was in reality no other than mademoiselle eugenie danglars daughter of baron danglars the once famous and opulent parisian banker the report also was current that albert and eugenie were engaged and would shortly be united in the bonds of matrimony another bit of gossip was to the effect that the former cantatrice's brother leon was not a man but a woman in short the real louise d'armilly who had loaned her name to eugenie danglars and assumed male attire solely for professional purposes this story was speedily confirmed for leon soon vanished and in his place appeared a most attractive and fascinating lady who very quietly assumed or rather resumed the name of louise d'armilly still another rumour was that the wealth so strangely inherited by the former prima donna was not a legacy at all but a gift from the mysterious count of monte cristo who had thus striven to make amends to the daughter for the misfortunes he had while pursuing his scheme of wholesale vengeance so remorselessly heaped upon the head of the father End of section 30. Section 31 of Edmund Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edmund Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter 29. Zuleika Goes to Monsieur Dantes. Monsieur Dantes was sitting alone in his library, busily engaged in reading a favorite work on the subject of political economy, and from time to time making copious notes. It was after midnight, and the vast mansion on the Rue du Elder was as silent as the tomb. The lamp on the deputy's table burned brightly, but a large metallic shade concentrated the light, 
and reflected it upon the table so that the other portions of the apartment were shrouded in almost complete darkness as m dantes read a shadow suddenly fell on the page of his book and quickly looking up he saw his daughter zuleika standing beside him tears were in her eyes and a look of melancholy rested upon her countenance why child said her father in a startled tone what is the matter with you you are weeping and seem very sad has anything happened to young massetti not that i am aware of papa answered zuleika in a low voice but nevertheless it is of him i wish to speak m dantes pushed his book from him motioned his daughter to a seat and prepared to listen as she did not begin at once but seemed to hesitate he said kindly i am waiting little one proceed thus encouraged zuleika summoned up all her strength and with downcast eyes commenced papa said she in the first place let me assure you that this is no mere lover's quarrel but a matter of the utmost importance that demands immediate action m dantes knitted his brows has the viscount been guilty of any impropriety toward you he asked fiercely no papa not toward me but i fear he may have been guilty of impropriety or at least of indiscretion with regard to another in the past a woman no doubt yes papa a woman a roman peasant i heard of some such thing while you were at the convent school in rome but dismissed it as a slander there may however be some truth in it but now i recollect giovanni's name was not associated with the scandal it was a mere inference on my part that connected him with the youthful member of the roman aristocracy mentioned by the gossips perhaps i am unjust papa in reviving your suspicions but giovanni's strange behaviour when i asked him the cause of his quarrel with esperance and of the continued coldness between them forced me to think there was something wrong his quarrel with esperance ah now i remember there was a quarrel but i imagined it was settled and that their relations were altogether friendly they are enemies papa or seem to be and that is not all esperance accuses giovanni of having been guilty of some infamous deed you have spoken to esperance then on the subject yes papa and what did he say he dealt in vague denunciations and positively refused to give me any definite information that is singular but what is still more so is that both giovanni and esperance seem bound by some fearful oath not to disclose the dread secret in their possession bound by an oath yes papa but why both of them should have been so bound unless they were accomplices i cannot see i even went so far as to accuse esperance of complicity whereupon he grew as white as chalk and protested his entire innocence and in his confusion uttered the name of luigi vampa zuleika zuleika you certainly misunderstood your brother he could not have mentioned the name of that man do you know who this luigi vampa is perfectly papa luigi vampa is a notorious roman brigand exactly my child and therefore could not possibly have had any dealings either with the viscount or esperance but i am sure of the name nevertheless esperance said luigi vampa m dantes was evidently startled he arose to his feet and paced the library excitedly zuleika had expected this and hence was not surprised at last her father resumed his seat and when he again came within reach of the lamp's rays she saw that his visage was even more pallid than usual and that he was not a little agitated she waited for him to speak and in a few seconds he did so zuleika said he in a tone of decision i will see both the viscount and my son in regard to this matter for now that luigi vampa seems to have had a share in it close investigation is imperatively demanded you may interrogate them papa but i am convinced in advance that you will derive no information from either of them the strange power that holds sway over them you cannot break but there is one thing you can do what is that zuleika write to luigi vampa write to vampa why should i do that 
because i feel assured that he is in possession of the full details of the terrible secret whatever it may be and will communicate them to you if you ask him to do so m dantes gazed at his daughter curiously what makes you think i have such influence over this roman brigand he asked sharply oh papa do not be angry with me cried zuleika but i have heard how vampa released the viscount de morcerf at your simple solicitation without a single franc of ransom though he had previously demanded a very large amount from the unfortunate man as the price of his liberty i have heard this and the natural inference i drew was that if the brigand chief went so far as to surrender his prey to you he would certainly answer your letter and tell you all he knew about the matter that so closely concerns my happiness and esperance's good name i am not angry with you my child replied the deputy in a milder tone for i know how deeply you have this affair at heart i will write to luigi vampa as you desire this very night and in two weeks at the furthest his answer may be expected but to-morrow i will talk with esperance and then will question the viscount rest assured that this matter shall be sifted to the bottom i know the extent of your love for giovanni massetti i also feel confident that i am not deceived in him and that he will be amply able to prove himself entirely worthy of your hand i have seen too much of men's alike and studied them too deeply to be deceived in reading character oh thank you thank you ever so much papa both for your promise and your kind encouraging words i too have full faith in giovanni but still i cannot rest satisfied until his record is entirely and conclusively cleared no one must have the power to breathe even a suspicion against the good name of your daughter's husband spoken like a girl of spirit said m dantes his eyes sparkling with enthusiasm and admiration now leave me and i will write to vampa zuleika kissed her father and quitted the library with a much lighter heart than she had entered it m dantes by the exercise of his iron will had managed to control himself in her presence but now that she had gone he gave free course to his emotions for a full hour he sat leaning on his writing-table his frame convulsed with anguish and his mind filled with sad forebodings he did not for an instant doubt that both esperance and the viscount could clear themselves from any criminal or dishonourable charge if they would consent to open their lips but their silence and zuleika's belief that they were bound by some fearful oath gave him great uneasiness besides his son had mentioned luigi vampa's name and the thought that the young man was involved in some complication with the roman bandit sent a chill to his heart he was convinced that whatever had occurred had been merely the result of the folly and headlong disposition of youth but this was scarcely a consolation for he well knew to what length young men sometimes allowed themselves to be carried especially in what they considered a love affair in addition the more he thought of the half-forgotten roman scandal the more clearly its particulars returned to him he remembered that a young and handsome peasant girl had been mysteriously abducted and that eventually she had been brought back to her home by one of the shepherds known to be in league with luigi vampa and his band she asserted that she had been carried off to the bandit's haunt by her youthful lover who had passed for a peasant lad but was in reality a nobleman this was all m dantes could distinctly recall though he was certain he had heard other details that had slipped his memory at the period of the abduction he now remembered both esperance and the viscount were temporarily absent from rome then followed their return and the quarrel that had almost resulted in a duel but had suddenly been patched up without apparent reason had esperance and the viscount been concerned in the abduction that was a question that only they or luigi vampa could answer and it was evident the young men would not speak vampa then must be made to speak for them that was the sole course left to pursue for the peasant girl had disappeared immediately after her return and her whereabouts were a mystery 
monsieur dantes drew writing materials before him and wrote his letter to the brigand chief it was brief but to the point when it was finished it bore the signature edmond dantes count of monte cristo the deputy placed it in the drawer of his table to go by mail the following morning having first folded and sealed it thompson and french rome was the direction it bore end of section thirty one section thirty two of edmond dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmond dantes by edmund flagg chapter thirty two interviews the morning following the events detailed in the last chapter as esperance was in his dressing-room preparing to take a short stroll through paris ali knocked at the door and signified that m dantes wished to see him at once in the library as such a summons was something unusual the young man immediately concluded that zuleika had been in consultation with her father and that he would now have to submit to a close and rigid examination he had expected such an examination but nevertheless the summons filled him with dismay and he grew pale as wax his limbs trembling beneath him and his hands working nervously however he braced up as well as he could and with as firm a step as it was possible for him to assume walked toward the library on the threshold he paused and his courage so utterly forsook him that he was tempted to take refuge in flight but the thought flashed through his mind that this would be cowardly and making a supreme effort to control himself he entered his father's presence m dantes who was seated at his writing-table examining a curious manuscript written in arabic characters looked up as he came in and fixed his eyes searchingly upon his son's countenance noting its extreme pallor and remarking with manifest uneasiness the difficulty esperance experienced in maintaining a firm demeanour motioning the young man to a seat he said my son i have sent for you on a matter of the utmost importance and i sincerely hope you will see fit to tell me in all frankness whatever you may know in regard to it esperance partially closed his eyes as if suffering intensely bringing his teeth firmly together and compressing his lips as he did not speak m dantes continued i have every reason to believe that the revelation i am about to ask of you will be exceedingly painful for you to make but you must consider that your sister's happiness is deeply concerned and that for that reason no matter what may be your motives you have not the right to maintain silence i know what you mean father replied esperance in an unsteady voice but notwithstanding the pain it gives me to do so i must ask you nay entreat you not to question me for i cannot answer you m dantes cast upon his son a glance that seemed to pierce him through and through the young man quailed beneath it and again partially closed his eyes while a faint blue shade was mixed with the waxen pallor of his visage the deputy though he had made a profound and exhaustive study of men and their varied motives though he was a skilled anatomist of the human heart and a ready reader of the human countenance acknowledged to himself that this time he was completely baffled was it fear or guilt that esperance exhibited he could not tell but it was abundantly evident that the young man was not acting a part that he keenly felt the suspicions to which he was exposing himself by his inexplicable conduct at length m dantes said in a mild but determined tone esperance my son you can at least enlighten me upon a few points and i request nay i command you to do so are you bound by oath to preserve silence concerning this matter i am bound by a most solemn oath answered the young man with a shudder and is giovanni massetti likewise so bound he is i will not ask you who administered that oath to you or under what circumstances it was taken 
although as your father i have a right to do so and to compel you to answer neither will i interrogate you further in regard to the main question at issue the complication in which you and the viscount seem to be so hopelessly involved but i insist that you inform me whether any guilt or stain of dishonour rests upon you father said esperance rising and lifting his right hand toward heaven i solemnly swear to you that whatever wrong may have been done whatever crime may have been committed i am entirely guiltless and that there is not the slightest stain of dishonour upon me i believe you my son said m dantes in a tone of conviction and this unequivocal assurance from your own lips removes the weight of a mountain from me now tell me is the viscount massetti as blameless in this affair as you are the so-called viscount massetti is a black-hearted villain cried esperance excitedly he is guilty of a foul and revolting crime a crime that should condemn him to a life of penal servitude but may you not be mistaken may you not be the victim of some delusion asked m dantes anxiously i am neither mistaken father nor the victim of a delusion replied esperance positively the charges that i make against that miserable apology for a man i can fully substantiate should the proper opportunity ever be offered me zuleika informed me that while you were speaking with her upon this mysterious subject the name of luigi vampa escaped your lips does that notorious brigand possess a knowledge of this unfortunate matter esperance became violently agitated and instantly answered that is a question my oath forbids me to reply to so be it said m dantes but i have written him and he will reply for you you have written to vampa exclaimed the young man with a terror-stricken look then all is lost m dantes smiled and rising placed his hand on his son's shoulder esperance said he calmly if neither crime nor dishonour attaches to you in this affair as you have sworn you have nothing whatever to fear and besides vampa's disclosures may relieve you of some portion of your heavy burden oh god groaned the young man if vampa speaks how shall i be able to prove my innocence my son said m dantes impressively god whose name you have invoked will not desert you in your hour of need bowing his head in his hands and trembling like an aspen leaf esperance quitted the library with a convulsive sob as if the last ray of hope had been withdrawn from his life and all was darkness and despair m dantes threw himself in his chair and for an instant was plunged in absorbing thought then he arose and putting on his hat and cloak left the library a few moments later he had quitted the mansion by a private door closely muffling his face in the folds of his cloak that he might not be recognized the deputy from marseilles passed hurriedly from street to street until he stood before a massive building in the rue vivienne he rang the bell and when the concierge appeared said to her is the viscount massetti at home the woman a large fat lumbering creature cast a sleepy glance that was half curious half suspicious at him and answered yes monsieur but he bade me deny him to everybody he will see me however my good woman said m dantes take my card to him the fat concierge took the card and glanced at it when she read edmond dantes deputy from marseilles she stared at the famous republican leader like one possessed then filled with awe she hastened away and climbed the stairs as fast as her cumbersome legs would let her she returned panting and puffing followed by the viscount's valet who with much ceremony and obsequiousness conducted the distinguished visitor to his master's apartments the salon into which m dantes was ushered was large and sumptuously furnished evidences of wealth and luxury were visible on every side while everything displayed the utmost taste and elegance 
to what am i indebted for the honour of this unexpected visit my dear count said massetti rising from a handsomely carved red velvet upholstered armchair in which he had been indolently reclining and coming forward to greet his guest to a matter that concerns both of us deeply replied the deputy in a meaning tone a shadow crossed the viscount's handsome visage but it was gone in an instant and he said with the utmost politeness pray be seated my dear count and before proceeding to business refresh yourself with a glass of rare old burgundy here stefano wine and glasses m dantes sat down in an armchair precisely resembling that from which the viscount had arisen massetti resumed his seat and the valet brought the old burgundy and glasses placing the decanter and drinking vessels on a small table of glistening ebony between his master and the deputy after they had duly drunk each other's health m dantes said i regret my dear viscount that i am compelled to disturb you but my business was too urgent for delay you don't disturb me in the least pray proceed you remember your conversation with my daughter just before you and she parted do you not i remember it replied the viscount colouring slightly and evidently growing ill at ease in that case neither preface nor explanation is necessary i called to ask you a few plain questions the italian was now a prey to singular excitement he grew pale and flushed by turns finally rising and pacing the salon in great agitation count said he abruptly when he could command his voice you are a man of the world and a cosmopolitan and of course you know that one often commits folly especially when the ardent and uncontrollable blood of youth is rushing through his veins with this explanation imperfect though it be i must ask you to rest satisfied for it is utterly out of my power to give you any other or to enter into the details of the unfortunate affair which has brought you here i assure you however that i am altogether blameless in the matter investigation will abundantly establish the truth of what i say i will make that investigation i regret that i can neither empower you to do so nor aid you in it what am i to understand by that simply what i say you are doubtless aware that my son makes grave accusations against you that he accuses you in fact of a dastardly crime esperance is mistaken my dear count i swear to you that he is mistaken and that i am as innocent as he is but luigi vampa may have a different tale to tell luigi vampa cried the viscount coming instantly to a dead halt and a sudden pallor overspreading his entire visage yes luigi vampa i have written to him and in two weeks will have his answer for esperance's sake for my sake for your daughter's sake destroy that answer as soon as received and without reading it exclaimed the young italian wildly his pallor increasing to such a degree that his face resembled that of a corpse should i be mad enough to do so said m dantes calmly with it all hope of your marriage with zuleika would perish oh do not say that do not say that groaned massetti what would life be worth to me without zuleika's love then deserve that love by clearing yourself by proving that your record will bear the light of day i have sworn to you that i am innocent is not that enough no replied m dantes coldly i must have proof to support your oath then you believe me guilty in spite of all this is the worst blow yet it is in your power to completely justify yourself at least so you give me to understand and yet your refusal will forever separate you from the woman you love you fill me with despair said massetti in a smothered voice sinking upon a sofa i fain would reveal everything to you but an awful oath of silence stands between me and the revelation then i must wait for vampa's answer and shape my course by that said m dantes firmly that 
answer will destroy both esperance and myself replied the viscount in a hoarse whisper we shall see returned the deputy rising and resuming his cloak as he stood at the door of the salon with his hat in his hand he added i thought you all a man should be viscount and that you would make zuleika happy but my convictions have been sadly shaken i came here thinking that love for woman was all-powerful in the heart of man that it would induce you to speak even in the face of an oath perhaps violently and iniquitously administered i was wrong farewell m dantes turned slowly and took his departure leaving giovanni massetti on the sofa plunged in grief and dismay End of section thirty two section thirty three of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmund dantes by edmund flagg chapter thirty one vampa's answer as the time for the arrival of luigi vampa's answer to m dantes letter approached esperance grew more and more uneasy and serious he spent the greater portion of every day from home apparently for the purpose of avoiding his father and sister when he returned he was moody depressed and silent and far into the night he could be heard pacing his chamber as if unable to sleep from excitement and anxiety zuleika endeavoured to comfort him but all her efforts were fruitless she poor girl was herself overwhelmed with her own distress though she strove to bear up against it massetti had neither written to nor attempted to see her since their separation a circumstance she could not reconcile with his protestations of ardent love for her and this served vastly to augment her sadness and anguish though she still believed in her soul that the viscount was entirely innocent of the crime laid to his charge m dantes who had plunged into politics deeper than ever since the success of the revolution was frequently in consultation with the republican leaders and many of them visited him at his residence and were closeted with him for hours at a time but though seemingly engrossed in state affairs the deputy did not lose sight of his son and daughter or of the mysterious complication that vampa was expected to make clear ali had strict orders to watch both zuleika and esperance and to report to his master whatever they did when at home in his absence but the faithful nubian found nothing amiss save that the young people seemed burdened with a sorrow he could not fathom at length when the two weeks that it would take to hear from rome had expired m lamartine called one morning at the mansion in the rue de helder and having finished his business with m dantes was invited by his host to remain to lunch the repast was served in the salle a manger esperance and zuleika partaking of it with their father and his illustrious guest when the edibles had been removed and the party were taking wine at the dining-table m dantes suddenly remembering that he had an engagement begged m lamartine to excuse him and remain with his son and daughter until his return that would be in half an hour at the utmost this arrangement effected the deputy arose from his chair threw his cloak over his arm and was about to take his departure when ali appeared on the threshold of the open doorway bearing in his hand a letter instantly divining that this was vampa's answer upon which hung massetti's fate and his own esperance leaped to his feet and fixed his wild and staring eyes on the ominous missive as if he would read its contents through its folds zuleika retained her seat but lifted her hands in terror and stared at the letter with pallid cheeks and blanched lips even lamartine turned in his chair and holding his glass in his hand gazed wonderingly at the nubian and the epistle m dantes alone seemed unmoved and his pale countenance gave no sign of the emotion struggling in his breast 
he stood like a man of iron and extending his hand took the letter without a tremor it was enclosed in a curiously fashioned envelope evidently made by the writer himself and bore the roman postmark the direction written in bold scrawling but perfectly legible characters read monsieur edmond dantes deputy from marseilles number twenty seven rue du helder paris france personal and private this direction was in french ali having retired the deputy calmly broke the seal and hurriedly ran his eyes over the missive espérance and zuleika eagerly and breathlessly watched his countenance while he read but it was as impassable as a countenance chiselled from marble when he had finished he turned to espérance and without a word handed him the letter for a moment the young man trembled so he could not read cold perspiration stood in heavy beads upon his forehead and vivid flashes of red passed before his eyes like sheets of lurid lightning what thoughts what suspicions what dread shot through his tortured mind in that brief moment making it seem an eternity of suffering at last steadying and controlling himself by a supreme effort he read the missive from which he had feared such terrible consequences it was in italian and ran as follows his excellency the count of monte cristo you ask me to answer your questions and i comply pasquale solara's daughter annunziata was abducted from her father's peasant home by giovanni massetti known as the viscount massetti who is no doubt the person to whom you allude as now in paris for he has disappeared from rome you are right in assuming that he had aid he was assisted by a young frenchman and that young frenchman was your son esperance annunziata suffered the usual fate of abducted peasant girls and was deserted by her dastardly abductor in a fastness controlled by my band when the abduction took place annunziata's brother strove to rescue her but was attacked and killed by massetti through my means the girl was returned to her home but she was miserable there and fled she is now in an asylum for unfortunate women founded at civita vecchia by the order of sisters of refuge and superintended by a french lady a madame helena de rancogne who as is said was formerly called the countess of monte cristo it is due to your son to say that he was entirely misled in regard to the abduction of annunziata solara and is altogether innocent of crime or intention to commit it the whole burden of guilt rests upon the shoulders of the viscount massetti who i believe compelled your son at the pistol's mouth to take a fearful oath of silence luigi vampa when esperance had read this letter that so effectually cleared him and was such a fearful arraignment of the viscount massetti he restored it to his father and sank into his chair utterly overcome by the terrible excitement and mental strain through which he had passed m dantes forced him to swallow a glass of wine that partially restored him then turning to m lamartine who had been an astonished spectator of this strange and to him incomprehensible family scene he said my dear friend you are amazed and you have a right to be this letter that has caused my son and daughter so much emotion comes from a roman brigand chief no other than luigi vampa whose name is notorious throughout europe you will understand its importance when i inform you that it conclusively clears my son of an exceedingly grave charge m lamartine arose and took esperance by the hand i heartily congratulate you said he and giovanni massetti asked zuleika in a tremulous voice giovanni massetti is unworthy of my daughter's hand replied m dantes let me see that letter said zuleika her cheek growing paler and her heart beating tumultuously her father gave it to her she took it and read each line with an intensity of interest that was painful to behold when she had reached the end her eyes suddenly lighted up and the colour came rushing back to her pallid cheeks 
espérance she said facing her brother with an air of resolution beneath which he quailed luigi vampa has not told all something he has kept back and that something you know what is it speak luigi vampa has told the truth replied the young man doggedly yes but not the whole truth what has he kept back esperance shook his head he has told the truth he repeated did the viscount massetti administer the oath of silence to you he did then who administered that oath to giovanni the young man did not answer there is some mystery about this complicated affair yet unexplained and until it is explained i cannot believe giovanni massetti guilty come come my daughter said m dantes soothingly your heart speaks and not your mind my heart and mine both speak papa replied zuleika and both say that giovanni massetti is innocent let him prove it then i feel certain that he can and will well well child go to madame dantes and take counsel of her only a woman can heal a young girl's love wounds zuleika quitted the salle a manger her countenance yet bearing the stamp of an inflexible belief and a fixed determination esperance said m dantes your honour is unstained and you are restored to my heart i thank god for the blessings of this day you are a true father edmund as well as a true patriot said m lamartine and i feel assured that your son will be worthy of you and of our beloved france that very day giovanni massetti received an unsigned little note written in a tiny feminine hand it was phrased thus i believe you innocent in spite of all prove to me and to the world that you are so enclosed in this little note was luigi vampa's letter to m dantes the next morning it became known that the viscount massetti had disappeared from paris gossip assigned a thousand scandalous motives for his sudden flight but gossip could form no idea as to whither he had fled zuleika however knew that he had returned to italy to clear his name and prove himself worthy of her love end of section thirty three end of edmund dantes by edmund flagg